I think he had a class in San Francisco State. And he invited me to come to San Francisco State to show some of my videos. And uh, so I went to San Francisco State and I played the movies. And when I went up at the end of the pictures, the whole audience hissed and booed. The, the pictures were good, but I think the tone of students that uh, time was just to be aggravated, um, you know, disgruntled people. And so James tried to protect me. I remember he tried to like put his arm around me like, hey, don't, don't worry about them. And that was sort of a nice thing that I remember about James. The students, the stupid little snot noses. But James was sort of a, like a, you know, a nice, not a granddaddy, he was a lot older than me, but still the fact of trying to protect me from this stupid, disgruntled mob. Just unhappy. Just to, you know, complain about any damn thing. Malcontents, that's what they were. And James wasn't. James always put on a very happy ear, you know, like a, and um, that's what I remember most about him. Also, I, you know, I would go to meetings because I, I was a colleague of James Broughton at the San Francisco Art Institute. And um, I rather admired the fact that he'd fall asleep during the meetings, the faculty meetings. You know, his eyes would be closed. And I thought that was a big plus because they were rather dry meetings and stuff. He generally knew what was going on, but he, you know, he would wake up and then make an opinion but uh, that was my impression of him. No, who booed him? East Coast people? Yeah, they would boo him. I don't think, I think it had a very, uh, you know, California feel to it. Beds outside, uh, oak trees, you know, and grassy hills and people hugging one another. I think it's much despised a lot on the uh, East Coast. Because there was another filmmaker, Ed Emshwell, and he used to have uh, dancers and they all wore leotards. And uh, anybody that's dancing with a leotard and also sunsets are booed back east. They're considered ridiculous cliches and stuff. Also, if you're nursing your kids, women, if they got the uh, bazooms out and the, the kids are getting nursed, the people on the east coast don't like that. They're much more closed in and stuff. In fact, I don't think uh, James Brown cared too much for another east coast filmmaker. I think it was Ken Jacobs. I think Ken Jacobs might have said something to him because I noticed he... Uh, it was some kind of a thing, because I had Ken Jacobs do something, and he seemed mad. Um, James on the telephone, like, why did you let him do that? So there might have been a kind of that antagonism, because James was very much California. Uh, it wasn't close. You know, I would talk to him now and then. I was friends, um, was a student, Kurt McDowell, and he went to the school. And James was very important for Kurt McDowell's career. Uh, Kurt McDowell started making films because uh, he, he was originally a painter, and he went into the film department, and there was another teacher there who used to be married to Gunvor Nelson, and that was Bob Nelson. And Bob Nelson was head of the uh, film department. And uh, uh, Kurt got into the film department, then he heard a, a very rousing speech by James. And it was all about, you know, your first picture is your most important picture, and this is your major thing, and this is very important. And he got very inspired, and he made his first picture. And uh, he finished it, and he rushed over to James and said, James, I have my new picture, and I would like to show it to you. And James said, please don't bother me now. Like, <laughs> so I thought it was hilarious, because he had this funny kind of thing, you know. You get to be a certain age, and you put up with so much, you know what I mean? You put out, and then you've had enough, you know what I mean? So he was kind of brass tacks for a while. I remember Kurt telling me that story. Kurt McDowell. Kurt went on to make pictures, you know, and he was later sometimes criticized by other faculty. He was like, he cheapened life. And James, you know, James had, you know, beds going down hills and naked people on the beds and stuff. And any kind of humping was sort of, it wasn't antiseptic, it was nice. It was California, it was out, the, you know, the sunshine. Kurt McDowell was a different kind of sex. Well, it could be not exactly back alleys. Yes, it could be back alleys and uh, humping in that regard. But James was out in the sunshine. So it was kind of strange. And then, um, oh, I remember one, there was one showing I went to. It was at the Cinematheque. And there were a lot of people in there, and they were kind of high-class people at the Cinematheque waiting for the latest James Broughton, Joel uh, movie. And I heard Joel saying, oh, this is really going to upset them. This is really going to get them held up. He had this glee in his eye. And it was all, I think it was Joel's pecker. And it was all erect on the screen. And then it, you know, then it drooped as the picture went on. And he was getting a big kick out of it, Joel. And the audience just sat there. 
So I think they had that kind of devilish thing where they enjoyed doing these sexual you know, pictures, but then also upsetting the audience, tipping over the boat or whatever that was. And it seemed to work in that case. Then James Broughton saw a flying saucer. For some reason, I was talking to him, and he had seen a flying saucer. So he's one of those avant-garde filmmakers who saw a flying saucer. Stan Brackett saw one, Kenneth Anger, of course. So he did, at one point, in Northern California, run into a flying saucer. Otherwise, you know, I don't uh, know that much about uh, James Brown. He did come over the house. I think I'm in one of his movies, or maybe we were cut out. Me and my brother. He came over the house. I don't know if Joel was with him. Yeah, I think because there was somebody doing the shooting. And he wanted my brother and I to get into the tub naked. We just don't do that. You know, I take a bath and I close the door. You know, my brother and I look at each other now and then, but we don't often do it when you live with somebody for like 60-something years. You know, you don't look at one another. You know you exist, and you talk to one another when it's important. So we found it strange, but also we didn't find it strange because you, I think you reach a certain age, and after a while, like, why photograph people with their clothes on? And I think that was his general... He had no interest in photographing people with their clothes on at that point in his life. And so there was, like, no incentive... So I don't know if we were cut out. We did get into the tub, but we had clothes on. Oh, so you did get into the tub? Yeah, but I can't remember if there was water in there or not. It's just that we didn't want to be naked. I don't know. Probably everybody else was naked. I did used to go to the showings when he had these groups of elder men in the, the forests and the knolls, and they were all naked and stuff. It wasn't like a wild orgy. It was kind of like a nature sprites or something, elderly nature sprites romping around. I thought it was interesting. You know, I don't mind. But uh, they kind of looked like trees to me. You know, they had, uh, you know, they were gnarled and in interesting shapes and stuff. And it was all black and white, so it was hard to distinguish them from rocks and tree trunks. So um, I thought it was kind of interesting. Whereas one time I went to another picture, Barbara Hammer was making movies, and she would have uh, lesbian love scenes. But the women were in their 80s or something. I remember one young lesbian uh, student said to me, how could she do that? That's disgusting. You know, but I didn't find his stuff uh, bad. Stan Brackage, yeah, I met him. Uh, Stan Brackage got interested in my movies because uh, he saw one of our class movies that was the cheapest that I made with my students. The budget was $150. It was a black and white picture. And he was with Peter Kabelka, and we were across the bay in um, Leonard Lipton's house and they were playing a 16 millimeter print of that picture. I happened to bring it along. And um, Brackage and Cabelga couldn't stop laughing. They were just hysterical through the whole picture because of the cheap effects and stuff. It was everything that they would never do and that they wouldn't think that anybody else would do. And that's when Stan Brackage became a fan of my pictures, that cheapest class movie. And uh, Stan then, because he had been through so many medical crises, he was actually helpful to me. When I had something wrong with me, he was like a, a, an uncle or some uh, a doctor that you knew that was in the family, and he would say, oh, this is not so bad, I had that, and you're gonna be fine. And so he became uh, almost like a, a guardian. He would call me up and then check up on me, how was the operation, and this and that, and you know everything would be all right. Uh, the images I remember is a bed going down a big hill, you know, in California with the yellow grass and stuff. And people, I think they were under the covers, but uh, the covers came off at some point. And that had that jingly kind of music with it, so I was always happy. And uh, that's mainly what I remember. And then some of his poetry, which was kind of interesting. In fact, he gave me a poetry book and he signed it to George, A Brother in Light, something like that. So that was nice of him. Oh, and then uh, James, I don't think, cared too much for Hollywood movies. Because at one time, I brought, uh, I rented a 16 millimeter print of Douglas Sirk's Written on the Wind. I wanted to play it to my class. And I think it's a, quite a beautiful movie. And so I said to James, James, I have this movie. You want to, before I send it back, you want to show it to your class? And uh, I guess he did. And the next day, I came into the, the uh, film office and he said, that picture's over there, and it was underneath the sofa. He didn't even want to touch it, you know? And so I picked it up. So I don't think he was much of a fan of those kind of Hollywood pictures, melodramas and stuff. Yeah, they're totally different. You know, uh, mine are kind of secretive, and of course they're East Coast movies. And there'd be a lot of that kind of activity would be in the shadows. 
and mine pictures generally aren't on a celebration. They're more like a, a horror of uh, obsessions and stuff that people, my characters, can't quite handle. Like, how did I get into this position and stuff? Why did I get this strange kink or something? And, uh, you know, overblown, it wasn't out in the sunshine. I would be more uh, smog-ridden and uh, not that we don't have smog here, but uh, I guess shadowy kind of stuff. And his was totally different. His was uh, sunshine, outdoors, uh, seemed to be a desire to be uh, happy and a joyous time and stuff, no matter what. Even though he was getting old, and getting old was just uh, seemed to be a, a chance to have another gigantic party, invite everybody. And so there were birthday parties after birthday parties with giant cakes and people playing music and, and um, singing and poetry reading. And he would be in these smocks and they were all light colored with a hint of uh, Buddhism or something. And um, it seemed like one big giant excuse to have a good time, you know. There was one thing, somebody told me one time that uh, he was with Joe and it was somewhere up in uh, the Northwest and suddenly he had strange heart palpitations, James. He couldn't breathe or something. He felt that he was gonna die and he panicked. And they said it was interesting to see because you know, he's on a different plane and would be thinking of the greater thing. And instead he was just like all of us, like, oh no, they're telling me gonna drop dead now. And he had a severe panic. And I remember, I forget who told me this, but they, they also found it kind of interesting. He was like one of us. I don't know what his religion was. It seemed like a Buddhist thing, something to do with the East. And then the fact that, you know, sometimes you think about these things and then you hope that it gives you like a kind of an inner peace. But that this moment came when you look like I'm gonna drop dead now and then he panicked like everyone else. So I thought that was kind of uh, interesting. And, you know, because he, he was like that, he was a strange contrast. I remember one time I happened to go into the film room and the projection room, and there was another student there, and he was rather effeminate and kind of, I don't know, pompous. And James came in and said, get, get away from the projector. I'm busy right now. I've got a class right now. <laughs> I thought that was rather interesting because it was the other side of the man. You know what I mean? And, uh, and the other student was like, oh, oh. Same kind of like a different kind of pompous attitude, like how dare he do that to me? So, um, you know, he had that kind of interesting dichotomy. And the most shocking thing is I went to the movies and I saw that Jim Carrey and the Grinch that stole Christmas, it was James Broughton, only green. I mean, it had the eyebrows and uh, it was a shocking reconstruction of James Broughton. And I was telling everybody, you gotta go see, it's like James come to life. Like the Grinch that stole Christmas. That was James. I mean, <laughs> physically, I'm not <laughs> the personality. I can't remember much. What was the personality? It might have been like that, you know, but it was a green version physically of James Braddon. It was the closest thing I ever saw. I was rather amazed and stuff. Yeah, it's like everyone else. You know, you see them, and there is a general appearance you make to the public. And then there is, of course, this other side, which everybody has, but, uh, and his thing, it was funny to watch because it was so drastic from what had preceded it before. But it's something that you expect because, uh, you know, it's the human element. It was something that I sort of found very interesting. Yeah, it was very human. It wasn't something I said, I wouldn't go near that guy. You know what I mean? It made him more down to earth and stuff. Because in a way you realize, you know, the California thing is nice and all, but uh, you got earthquakes, you got uh, firestorms and stuff like that. And then you got strange personality shifts, you know, some, some of it's kind of monstrous. And so he personified all that stuff, I thought. The differences in the personality, you know, one minute this way and then the rest is like, I gotta get on with things and get away from that projector from my class. Huh? Well, don't bother me now. This is your first film, and, you know, <laughs> we have to do in a big speech. You know, it's almost like showtime. It's almost like the birthday parties. There were big, massive affairs and stuff with cakes and stuff. Now, who was he married to? He was married to, uh, how did he run off with that student? If you're gay, you usually don't. Uh, you're married unless it's to put on an act or something. You know what I mean? So, and then to run off with a student, that's like the, one of the biggest scandals in, in a regular school. Not that the art institute is a regular school, so of course nobody gives a damn. And it was no earth-shaking thing, because at that school, you know, so much goes on. Uh, so, but I just thought it was kind of interesting that he run off with a male student, especially if he had been married. And I wasn't sure if he married to that big critic. Did she blast his pictures afterwards? 
Was she on the warpath? Or we would go to meetings and they would be either at the school or somebody's house. But I, I just remember him sleeping during the meetings. I can't remember any kind of interactions I had with him at the meetings. He did defend pictures that sometimes I was too stupid enough to realize that the picture had some merit. But he was very gentle in his defense. He didn't you know, act like, hey, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. And so uh, in that way, he was very uh, open to uh, you know, avant-garde imagery and stuff and uh, a different kind of pacing and all. They were bright. You know, the colors were strong, and um, there was not that much, uh, uh, it was all out in the open, it wasn't that much uh, mystery, there was like a, you know, it didn't make you depressed, unless you hated sunshine. It was like, you know, tinkling, it was doing stuff like that. So, uh, I did go to a big show of his movies, and I just remember the bed going down the hill. I can't remember the rest of the other movies. The brass bed, you know, the big headboard and stuff. That's the only thing I remember of his movies. Nothing at all, you just sat through them. There was nothing really to dislike, you know what I mean? And they were pictures you sat through and uh, it was pleasing and and, um, and they didn't go on that long. So there was nothing really to get you disgruntled. <laughs> it was uh, you know, it was an idea of like Northern California, I guess, the classic thing of Northern California at a certain time of year. I don't know if you ever shot pictures in the winter. I can't remember any cloudy pictures. It was all sunshine. It wasn't a cloud in the sky. And it looked like all across the, um, the Golden Gate over there. I never saw, a, I don't think I ever saw a picture he did here in San Francisco. I know he did a few here in the city at some point, you know? Something stays in my mind with the shots at houses and stuff. I think adding the poetry onto the soundtrack and then the general, even though he was getting older, there's still what seemed like joy in his life and kind of a celebration and, you know, bringing people together, not only in the theater to look at these movies, but uh, a general melding of uh, what's trying to be positive and sunny and, and uh, the soundtrack and I think that kind of thing and almost putting a face on what many people consider a California cliche, you know but putting in a, in a very nice uh, manner. So I think uh, that's a, a vibe. Hit the, the person himself also, when he would appear with the pictures, always upbeat and stuff. Never, never on stage a lemon. I liked I never knew what exactly he did in the picture, if he photographed them or what he, you know? And I never knew his exact role. He controlled the whole thing, but I didn't know if he was behind the camera or what. So, uh, and I never saw him in the editing room. The only time I ever saw him was in the sound room when he was doing a uh, reading of his poetry, and I think it was to be on a film. And uh, that's the only thing. So I never really saw him with actual film in his hands and at the splicer and stuff. So I'm not sure how he uh, worked out alone in the field, you know. He was well-liked here. He'd go to his shows, and uh, there were generally uh, older people in the audience, and people that you know, seemed to know him for years. And then uh, the young people sat through the pictures also. The shows were never like three people in there. There was always kind of a big crowd. The, sh the main things that, the shows would happen now and then, but the main things were the birthdays. Big bashes, you know. And every year there would be a big bash and then there'd be uh, hundreds and hundreds of people all together. So as a joining, fierce, uh, joining force of getting all these people together, it was kind of good. The parties were held in a theater. He'd be on stage, and he'd be hugging people, and he'd be saying his poetry, and there'd be music playing, and there'd be country singers, and um, it was that kind of thing. So um, I guess it's like audience participation, because then they'd all go down at the end, and there'd be a big giant cake, and there'd be drinks, and it was never it seemed to be an ugly scene. It was always kind of happy. Nobody made an ugly scene, as far as I know. The poetry uh, was interesting. I got a book of his poetry and I read it. It was nice, you know. The words were happy and they were clipped kind of short. And uh, I guess some of it rhymed. And, um, you know, it was poetry. It wasn't Edgar Allan Poe, something else. Normally I read science books, you know, movie books, history of uh, 
Hollywood and stuff. I read books like that. Once in a while, a novel. You know, I was making, uh, one time I was making these movies and I showed in Bard College and nobody liked the pictures, the faculty couldn't stand the pictures. But one girl said, boy, I like these movies, they're crazy because the plots are all kind of nutty. And she said, read this book, I think you will appreciate it. And the guy had, uh, he had the same style I was doing in the movies, but it was crazy because I read the book and then I went to sleep and I had the most vivid dreams. So writing is very, very important, uh, I think, in uh, making mental imagery and stuff. And this was, uh, and it was a perfect representation of the kind of movies I was making for some reason. So I think writing is very important. Plus, in my own stuff, I was interested in the way words sound. And James Broughton had a certain way of his. They seem like short, you know, spaces between the words, and they'd come out at you, and they wouldn't poke you, but they would be more like a sudden grab. Where I kind of like the way words sound, so I would sort of link them together. I didn't have as many spaces in between them. It seemed to me. Yeah, it was always like somebody on a piano or some homemade thing. It wasn't lifted from a record, you know what I mean? So it looked like he was in with a team of people from California who were on the same wavelength and were making these kind of upbeat, tinkling things, you know, pounding on a piano and stuff like that. And it wasn't depressing music. It uh, sounded like harpsichords, stuff like that, the kind of a lilting also thing. To match the bouncing bed and all. Nah. No, the only thing in the West Coast, I used to go to the movies on the East Coast and I used to see rocks and big hills and mountains behind the water and everybody's on the beach. Yeah, I used to see those uh, Frankie Avalon, Annette Funicello beach movies. And then I'd go to Westerns and it was all these big rocks and stuff. It was all alien to me because the East Coast, you cover up the bones of the planet. It's got all these plants and stuff. You know what I mean? And so uh, West Coast had alien environment, and, but I would go see that stuff. I guess I was more into Ilya Kazan, you know what I mean, like on the waterfront, pictures like that. I could also go for like Baby Doll, which had decayed mansions and stuff like that. And California was a whole different thing. But California, what I did enjoy was the, the glamour of the Hollywood and the color coordination and the makeup and the way the music came in, the themes of the different characters and the general craft of the damn pictures, especially in the 50s and stuff. And uh, some of the other pictures, you know, the pictures from the 40s made here in California, they seem very uh, realistic and stuff and as far as human drama, not so silly. You know, nowadays sometimes they seem kind of silly, but of course they're made for a different audience because mostly young people are going to the audience. So it's mainly about mermaids and young people getting involved with a mermaid or something. You know, but you realize this is for an audience. But then suddenly you see some of these movies that were made here in California. You know, it's not so shallow, California. But uh, you see some of those movies and they have a lot of depth as far as like human feeling and stuff. Perhaps it's the writers, a lot of them came from the East. And then some the directors from Germany, you know. So there's a big influence here in California. But James Brown seemed very much a California a mentality, you know, like a Northern California and stuff. And he sort of uh, seemed to cement or solidify that in his work here. You know, my brother and I, we liked going to the movies. And so my mom used to take us to a lot of movies and we absorbed all the movies. And then my aunt had an eight millimeter movie camera. And so we borrowed that camera. This was before we were teenagers. And we started making movies. And then to learn the craft, uh, we would go to the movies and see how the movies were set up. Later on, it became for editing Alfred Hitchcock. To watch Alfred Hitchcock movies, you really knew how to edit because you watched these scenes and these people had to interact to be a shot of somebody looking up, reacting to what somebody said and stuff. They were kind of amazing. And then you can listen to those soundtracks like Bernard Herrmann and the kind of aura they created. And then for the technical thing, for $2, you get the how to shoot a movie story. And it told you how to, you know, close up, far shot, stuff like that. So for two bucks, you got the technical information. You got the camera, and of course you read the instruction book. And uh, so we were making movies, and then there was a whole burgeoning, evidently, of uh, artists making pictures, and it was the, uh, you know, became the American avant-garde. We had friends at that time who were bohemians, these Canadians, Bob Cowan, Bill Ronald, who was a painter, and it was Joyce Whelan, and um, they came down from Canada to New York to get absorbed, you know, more artwork and to uh, absorb the whole artistic scene in New York. 
And we got involved with him because Bob had the hots for a girl that I went to school with I was using in my movies, Donna Kness. And so um, she introduced me to Bob because he was doing paintings of her. And he became one of our stars and we got to meet all the people who were into the arts and knew about avant-garde movies and were going to these showings. And so uh, Bob Cowan invited me and my brother to one of the showings, it was at the Charles Theater, and it was avant-garde pictures, 16 millimeter. We were making eight millimeter. And uh, he said, these movies, uh, Ken Jacobs has a loft and they're playing movies and perhaps we can arrange a showing. And all these different artists came to this loft and my brother and I had an eight millimeter show. I had a job then, so did my brother, and I came in a shirt and tie, and these were like bohemians. And I played these movies, and evidently they were a big hit. So we were invited back, and then Jonas Meckes, who was writing columns with a village voice and championing the underground films, uh, wrote about us, and then we developed uh, like a fan club and stuff. You know, a fan base, people would come. And then we got to know these artists, because you know, I was trained as a commercial artist, so was my brother. We went to commercial art high school. And I had a job in the commercial art world. I used to draw weather maps for uh, Channel 4 in New York, NBC affiliate. And um, suddenly there was this whole door, the world opened up of these uh, artists and stuff who took interest in our work and would invite us over to the loft and they were smoking dope and they're doing all kinds of things that, I was you know, into donuts and coffee and stuff. And they're living in the Bronx with mom and, you know, had my own room and mom and dad and my brother also, but then this whole other world opened up. And then the only way to get, I would never get into a museum until I started making these movies, because I was an artist. And the way you get into a museum is if you drop dead, you know. But then here was this door open, some of the movies were playing in museums. And, uh, you know, they were scheduling me. And I, how do you get into the museum of modern art? You have to drop dead. You have to be like really great and drop dead. But suddenly here we were, we're in our 20s and stuff, and stuff was being screened. I remember being in an elevator with Willard, Willard Van Dyke, you know, who made these big things. He would go to the movies and stuff, you know, our movies and, I don't know. So it was a strange new world that opened up, you know. You know, Warhol would come to my shows. I uh, had uh, my first 16 millimeter movie was Corruption of the Damned. Uh, Warhol came about 10 minutes late, but he brought his whole entourage with him. I went to school with Warhol's henchman, the one who used to help him, Gerard Malanga. We were classmates. The West Coast, when I came to the West Coast, I would come, uh, I came here, I was invited to go to the Art Institute because I was here. I met Larry Jordan in um, Cincinnati. We were part of a film screening. And uh, we, I stayed extra time after my show because they said Larry Jordan's coming. I didn't know who he was. And so I stayed for his show and I liked his movies because I like animated pictures. And uh, we flew kites in a park. And then Larry said, you want to come sometime teach at the school this summer? I said, okay. So he got me a gig at the Art Institute. And uh, then I met Larry, then I met Gunva Nelson. She used to wear these big prairie dresses and stuff. And she was married to Bob Nelson. I met her once before. I used to come out here early and I knew uh, Leonard Lipton, who's now into th making 3D stuff. And so I gradually got to meet the West Coast people and they accepted me. And I would have, I would have shows down uh, in the Tenderloin. Well, there was Larry, there was Gunva, the big names. I did know uh, Bruce Connor, but that was from the East Coast. I had met him many years before in uh, Cambridge or Boston. He used to dress like a Quaker. He was very starched shirt. He had this weird Quaker tie and stuff. We could never make money with our filmmaking, I don't think, because nobody would want us. In other words, I'm kind of in this, not undisciplined, because I work, you know what I mean? I would work for hours on a picture, but I would lose money for the company. In other words, um, I, sometimes I go into a picture and I don't know exactly what I'm making. I have an idea. And then you get on the set and you work with somebody and you figure out the character. Sometimes I would like somebody, so I'd say, all right, look, you're on a telephone. Dial this, dial, and pick up the phone. And um, I did, sometimes I'd have dialogue. Otherwise, you're listening, then you hang up the phone. Then I'd find out who exactly was on the other end of that phone. And I would go and photograph another thing, and then I'd make a story around it. But actors generally can't stand that. They want to know exactly what's going on and stuff. And so whenever I do work with a real actor, they get irritated and annoyed. Also, I don't like going to meetings. Because, you know, why go to a meeting? Just get the camera and then shoot the damn thing. Also, I would rather make my own pictures, photograph them and do everything, because then you don't have to tell somebody to do it. It's sort of, it's the same thing like writing. Sometimes you got the most perfect screenplay, and then you think, well, I got it, it's perfect, it's in writing. Why bother to make it? You know what I mean? It's in another medium. And so sometimes you just start making the picture. 
And then uh, I always wanted to run a studio, a movie studio. I used to have dreams of you know being with maybe at a big table with Rock Hudson and all these big stars and stuff. And in a way, it became like the Art Institute when I go to the Studio 8 now. Like I'm signed up as I'm on the contract to teach a class and we have a production class and they are like contract players because they also signed to be in the class. And so in a way that was realized but on this strange kind of shrunken scale. You know what I mean? With minuscule budgets that run from $150 to $200. I don't think he's interested. I don't think nobody would be interested either in giving them money to make a picture. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just a whole other ball field. You know, I got a call one time from Paramount at the Art Institute because I got a good review in uh, the L.A. Times of a show that I had of my movies. And so Paramount called up and said, we want to see your movies. So I sent a bunch of movies, maybe on purpose. They were particularly obscure, kind of, you know, visually odd pictures. They came back immediately you know, with no letter. <laughs> Just, they sent it back. You know, they would have no interest. Absolutely no. There's no marketable interest, you know. Oh, James didn't like accents. I remember James came to me and said, this student, this Iranian accent, they can't understand. You know, I can't, you know, work with them. I said, send them to me, because I love people with accents in movies. It makes the movie seem more important, like it's a European picture or something like that. So I told James, listen, send them to me. I love them. But I think he found them annoying, anybody with a foreign accent. There was a tendency for a while at the Art Institute where you get together in a circle and you hold your chakras and you chant. I don't know if he did that. I think he did, because that's somehow I remember uh, that thing being mentioned, you know? That might have been a part of it. Whereas uh, Gunnar Nelson, she used to come in uh, to loosen them up, you have a big jug of wine, which of course you can't do anymore because they don't allow drinking on the campus, you know what I mean? I didn't want wine in my class because then you get these horrible little Napoleon characters. The smaller the students are, the more vicious they become when they're drunk. But uh, I think James handled it more in like a, you know, a, a Far Eastern Buddhist thing maybe with the chakra business. I never sat in on one of his classes, you know, but I would hear things about it and stuff. Holding chakras. Because <laughs> who else would be doing that? You know, we had another teacher one time from Germany, Rosa von Pronheim, and uh, he was at the school for one semester, and he met some guy in a dirty bookstore. He went into the dirty bookstore and became lovers. And so he wanted to make a story of their love, uh, you know, their love encounter, and so he brought the guy into class, and they wanted to do love scenes. And to feel comfortable, you know, they were naked. He asked all the students to take their clothes off also. And because he rubbed the student the wrong way, he had a kind of an abrasive personality at times. The student complained to the president of the school, and he got, he got uh, dismissed, I think. I don't know if he went through the whole semester and stuff, but it caused kind of a stink. I'm not sure if James had everybody nude. It's possible, you know, at that time... Uh, it was a different period. There might have been uh, some nudity. But that would have been on a different level, not so much the uh, Rosa von Pronheim thing. I'd have uh, Jim Carrey put on that makeup again, and it would be a perfect representation of James Bratton. So uh, that's what I would do. And then, um, you know, shoot it in, uh, uh, you know, shoot it in sunshine, that's all. I'd be more interested in the fact, you know, of the relationship with uh, him and Joel. What is, how many years difference was that? 35, that's what I mean, that kind of thing kind of interests me. Because I find uh, the things, people that you get involved in sexually, who you find sexually interesting, it's not really encouraging for older people to know that you know it doesn't end at a certain point. There are younger people that uh, you know might be interested in hooking up with you. That's the kind of aspect that I would be kind of interested in. I knew him, uh, you know, we would talk. I would talk to him a little more than I would with James for some reason. And, you know, at that time at the Art Institute, it was not uncommon for a teacher to be involved with the TA or have a sexual interlude with a student. It was not considered taboo. It was not uh, off the chart. And so there were several instructors who were, I would see them with their TAs and I would go to their house and sure enough they were having them as a, as a love interest. So, and then the students, um, you know, depend, if you're the same age as the students, they would come on to you sometimes. And um, 
to be a, a sexual interest. It, was, it isn't like now, where you post the hands off, and the administration does not realize that as you get older, it's more and more difficult to, to control your hands, like where they go. And so it's almost like a great um, danger in the craft of being an instructor, of suddenly, you know, the hands wander. But you control that, and nowadays everything is totally different. It's like a different world. But at that time, uh, it, was, it was strange. It was not like that at all, much more open. There seemed to be no earth-shaking thing going on. It was just taken as uh, okay. As I said before, I was just curious about uh, the wife and then the running away with the, the student. I'd lost a very happy person who didn't seem to mind he was getting older and older, who just seemed to make it a chance to celebrate once again. And um, I think more naked people, because evidently he was interested in getting more naked people on camera and uh, have them in the bright sunshine and stuff. And it didn't matter if they were old also. And just get them in nature. It was more like a nature spirit. That's what he seemed to me like, a reincarnation of some kind of a nature sprite or something. And he became more and more like that as time went on. Big joy. Yeah, I can imagine. From the waist up, or I guess so. I think it would be from the neck up. Because, uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> in other words, um, I can remember seeing him naked. He must have been naked in a lot of pictures. But I can't really remember. I guess he blended in with the other crowd or something in there. Oh, yes, I can. The God body. That's right. I remember that. Now it's coming back to me. Uh, Big Joy. Sounds good enough. Reminds me of Joy Lansing. Remember that woman? She was a blonde. She was in a lot of cheap old pictures. And she was, I think, Miss Utah at one point. She was in the Queen of Outer Space. The rocket goes off and she, her hair is blowing and stuff. So I would have chosen another name except Joy, Big Joy. But maybe for him it's okay. I never looked at Jane Bratton as twisted, you know what I mean? James Bratton was a happy man with ups and downs, I think. And he mainly was up, especially in public. And he made the public feel like they were up also. And the fact that uh, the, a continuation of like, you know, getting old and who gave a damn, as long as it was cake and drink and music and stuff. So I think that's what James Broughton was, a celebration of even getting on in years and forget about it. You can still be young in your head and young on the page, writing, creating poetry. This is it by James Broughton. This is it, and I am it, and you are it, and so is that. And he is it, and she is it, and it is it, and, and that is that. Oh, it is this, and oh, it is thus. And it is them, and it is us. It is now, and here we are. So this is it. This is it, number two. This is it. This is really it. And this is all there is, and it's, it's perfect as it is. There is no way to go but here. There is nothing here but now. There is nothing now but this. And this is it. This is really it. And this is all there is, and, and it's perfect as it is. There is nowhere to go but here. There is nothing here but now. There is nothing now but this. And this is it. This is really it. This is all there is, and it's perfect as it is. Are you willing to go? your own infinity, willing to relish a really fine undoing? What's wrong with going all the way for a bang-up crucifixion? As things are now, everyone is mad, asleep, or on the wrong bus. Don't trip. Don't trip on the leaps of your life. Jump! The traces need kicking over and over. Trust your inevitable Trust your ripcord, jump into the no, even if it kills you.